Right, well, welcome everybody to this uh, evening's training event. It's an introduction to helping you to identify birds and butterflies. Um, as we'll see, you know, with, particularly with birds, it's, um, it's quite an interesting challenge to know not so much what to include, but what to leave out. But butterflies are a little bit easier. But before we get to that, I'm just going to start sharing my screen. Um, just give me a sec. Right, I think we're in business. Um, so um, I'm going to ask Nesta just to say a few words um, because it's her project that is supporting um, all of these events during the summer. It'd be just useful to get um, a quick summary from you, Nesta, if you would. Yeah, sure. Hi. Um, I hope you can hear me okay. My internet's dropping in and out. It's um, fine. Good, great. So the Saving the Saffron Brook project is being delivered by the City Council, um, funded by the Green Recovery Challenge Fund, which is national funding. Um, and we're working with lots of partners, including Nature Spot, who Dave is representing today, um, and other local wildlife groups, as well as bigger organisations like the Wildlife Trust and uh, the County Council. Um, like, yeah, there's a, there's a whole range of partners who we're collaborating with in different ways. Um, I suppose I'll briefly just say that there's sort of two main arms to the project. So we're we're working on the Saffron Brook, which you some of you may know as the Wash Brook, which is uh, a tributary of the River Saw. It meets the River Saw on Aylston Road, just behind the gas works. Um, and it begins its life in Oadby and flows through the south of the city. Um, so we are working ecologically. We're an ecological project. We're working to increased biodiversity within the brook and uh, in the environment around the brook as well. So um, making what is in parts quite an unnatural, heavily concrete looking engineered piece of water into something that is a bit more natural, a bit more habitable and will encourage wildlife to thrive. Um, and then the other side of the project is events like these and others that we're running to try and involve the people, the communities that live around the brook to come and enjoy um, that environment and to really connect with nature, um, perhaps in new ways, perhaps people who have not spent much time outdoors before, or perhaps for people who, you know, are really keen to be outdoors and really keen to get involved with nature and would like to learn a little bit more, um, which leads us nicely into tonight's event, because that's exactly what this is about. So. Um, I'll hand back to you, Dave. OK, thank you very much, Nesta. Um, and as I'm sure you're aware, um, we're going to follow up tonight's session with a, a field meeting at the Washbrook Nature Area on Saturday. So I'm not sure if you're all booked on it. Uh, I think quite a few of you are. So hopefully I'll see you there. Um, so just kind of moving on. Um, this is partly this, these events are partly to support the uh, 100 Species Challenge which, as the name suggests, we are kind of throwing the gauntlet down to the public, uh, anybody really with an interest in, in nature, to see if you can record 100 different species. Um, and they have to come from 10 different wildlife groups. The purpose of that is to try and get people to look more widely at nature and not just rely on what you know. So you may know birds well or flowers or whatever, but you have to kind of extend it. And we'll give you lots of support, uh, as we're summarising on the screen uh, now. It's free to sign up. You can just do it from the next spot homepage if you want to want to give it a go. Um, so a lot of what I'm going to uh, say tonight and, and kind of introduce you to in terms of the species, um, you can um, download some of our guides to help remind you and add to what we're saying. Um, so we've got two on birds, one on garden birds and one on countryside birds. Uh, and one on, on common butterflies. Each of them covers 10 different species. And we pick species that are easy to find and relatively easy to identify. So what I'm gonna to do tonight is kind of pick some of the, perhaps more, well, some of these species and a few others, um, particularly maybe point out where you could get tripped up if you're not that familiar with them in terms of you know, lookalike species. 
Um, if you do join the 100 species, um, we have a version of these guides that gives a little bit more detail and helps you to record them. So it gives a little bit more specific guidance on that. But you can uh, just go to the, the link that's shown on screen uh, and, and get all of these for free. So um, what do you need to kind of get stuck into birds and butterflies? Obviously, I don't know what level of knowledge you've already got. Um, if you're an expert on, on birds, or butterflies or both, then probably this isn't the right uh, talk for you to join in. In fact, you should probably be giving it. Um, but hopefully, you know, if you unless you you are really into those subjects and know them in detail, we'll be able to kind of add a little bit to your, your knowledge tonight. Um, in both cases, it really helps to have a book and there's all manner of books out there. Um, I'm just I've just brought these up because I like the wild guide series. We do a whole uh, raft of different topics and these are just two of them um, but they're photographic guides not everybody likes photographs some people prefer drawings and there's kind of advantages and disadvantages both and if you're really going to seriously start looking at birds and butterflies it really helps to have a pair of binoculars uh, interestingly you wouldn't think that you would use binoculars for watching butterflies but it does help hugely um, because you, you know, it, most modern binoculars can um, zoom in on, on focus on something that's less than two meters away. So, um, you know, if you see a butterfly, it's hard sometimes to get closer to insects without scaring them off. This allows you to have a closer look. And I suppose the other thing, just to it sounds obvious, but um, just to stress, really, it's it's almost like a um, a matter of of attitude. You may have heard of um, a journalist called Simon Barnes. Uh, he's written a few books. I think one of them is called How to Be a Bird Watcher. But I, I heard him interviewed the other day, and he said he he was he was interviewed by some uh, some survey, and they said how often a, a week do you go bird watching, and he said he couldn't answer that question. He said because he never not goes bird watching. It's just whenever he's awake, is alive to the possibility of birds passing by his window or flying past his desk or. Well, not inside, obviously, but um, it, 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 there is a good point there that, you know, you just got to keep your eyes and ears about, you know, particularly this time of year when the leaves are on the trees, it's often easier to hear birds and spot them. And obviously, if you hear them, then it kind of gives you a bit of a target to look for. So it, it, on, on one level, it seems a bit of an odd um, combination, birds and butterflies, they're very different types of animals, um, but both of them kind of share this title of being um, some of the most popular groups. And for people that are getting interested in nature, it's often one or both of these groups that they will start with. For obvious reasons, you know, they're, they're high profile. There's always something around, obviously with birds particularly, um, and, and, and beautiful, many of them. Um, so just looking at, you know, what the challenge is to learn uh, the birds and butterflies, it's a lot harder to uh, get to grips with the birds because there's just so many of them. There's 10 times more birds in Leicestershire and Rutland than there are butterflies. So 325 species have been recorded, uh, whereas only around about 30 uh, butterflies. I'm just uh, fudging the number a little bit with butterflies because with climate change, there's new species that arrive all the time. And also there's um, a kind of trend, a bit of annoying trend really, where people will buy butterfly um pupa online you know and then you know the kids will breed them and and then they will let the adult go and there's been a bit of a trend also for letting butterflies go at weddings and so on so you're basically introducing species into the environment which not necessarily going to be there um but the other thing which i think is interesting to think about is obviously they both fly but um they both migrate. I mean, you'd be aware that many of our bird species migrate. Um, some migrate for the winter and some migrate for the summer. But uh, a lot of the butterflies that we see, um, then they will have, have come from visitors from abroad. And you wouldn't think a small, delicate looking butterfly could do this, but they can travel long distances by going really high up into the sky and catching some of the, uh, the, 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 the winds that will carry them across without them having to expend much, much energy. And there are some species like the painted lady, for example, which doesn't breed in this country at all. 
Um, so that might be a surprise to many because it's a fairly common butterfly, but pretty much everyone you see, certainly at the beginning of the year, has not spent the winter in this country. They've, they've traveled from abroad. So we're gonna start with birds um, and I'm gonna look at um, three main habitats. I'm gonna start with garden birds and in particular the, the tits. Um, these are kind of classic garden birds will come to food that you put out and um, possibly the, the, the easiest one to, to identify and, and arguably the, the most common one in, in, in gardens is the blue tit. It's easy to identify when you've got it close up like this, isn't it? You know, with the, with the blue cap. And also the bandit mask around the eyes is another thing to account for. The species that it can get mixed up with um, is the great tit. The great tit's slightly larger, but has no blue on it whatsoever. It shares the yellow breast, um, but the, the great tit has this black line right down the middle of its chest. And indeed the thickness of that black line uh, can help you decide whether it's a male or female. It's very hard to tell blue tits apart in terms of the sexes, but you can just about do it with great tits. With some birds, as we'll see later, it's so much more obvious to tell the males from the females. And another bird that's less common, but does quite frequently come into gardens, is the coal tit. Now, this is a, a really small uh, bird. It's slightly smaller than the blue tit even. And in the kind of big pecking order of birds, it's right down the bottom. If ever you see it uh, coming to feed on, uh, on seed, for example, it will only come in when there are no other birds there. And it's the first one to, to jump away if anything else arrives. Now you look at the cold tech and you think, oh, that's a bit drab. How are we gonna recognize that? Well, it's got quite a, a noticeable feature that is unique uh, amongst the tits. And that is this white line down the back of its head, a bit like a punk Mohican. Um, it's also got this kind of very nervy behavior. So it will, if it's coming to a feeder, you barely notice it because it will come flying in, grab a seed, and then fly away again straight away. And there's another tit. It's not actually in quite the same family, but it's in the long-tailed tits family. Um, but in my view, one of the most beautiful birds we've got in the UK. And this is one of the species that the RSPB have shown in their uh, big bird garden survey has become increasingly common in, in the last 10 years or so. And uh, they often come in, in groups, particularly in the winter, the groups can be quite large. You can easily have a dozen birds. Um, then they pair up in the spring and then they have quite large um, offspring, maybe 10 to 12. And then they'll stay as a family unit uh, into the autumn and then through the winter. So often if you see one, um, it'll be followed by, by others. But really beautiful bird with this kind of pinky hue and obviously this incredibly long tail. Looks a bit like a a lollipop, I think, on its stick. So that's the tits. Let's have a look at the, the finches, the next most common group that will visit our garden. Um, the, the chaffinch um, used to be arguably the, the commonest bird, breeding bird in, in, less, in, in the UK. I'm not sure if that's true anymore, um, but it's certainly one of the noisiest. You can, you can often hear them, particularly in woodland and, and, and so on. They've got a kind of distinctive loud call. And this is a case where the, the males and the females are quite noticeably different. So you've got the male on the top and the female on the bottom. But in a garden environment where the kind of palette of bird species is, is reduced compared to what you'd see in, uh, in terms of the wider countryside, one feature they've got in common, which stands out when they fly as well as when they're at rest, is this white wing bar. And um, most of the other I think none of the other finches have that, that wing bar. So um, that's, that's worth looking out for that. Obviously, the female looks a little plain in comparison, um, but say it's still got the wing bar. All finches are typified by a thick beak. It's quite a strong beak. It's designed for feeding on seeds, where they need to be able to crush the seed to get at the kernel on the inside. <clears throat> if you put seed out in your garden, you may notice that um, you get a whole pile of husks beneath the, beneath the, the feeder and that's the, because the finches are able to separate the shell and take out the kernel and spit the rest out. The other finch which is, is increasingly common in gardens is the goldfinch. Um, in many ways this is so easy to identify, although this picture doesn't show it that clearly, it's got this bright red face 
uh, and, and these kind of gold barge. You can see why it's called a goldfinch. Um, they used to be kept uh, as, as cage birds because they're considered so attractive. Uh, fortunately, that's now illegal. Um, they, although they're finches, they have a slightly different beak. It's a much narrower beak, more like a pair of pincers. And what this allows them to do, and this is what they've adapted to do, is they specialise in really small seeds that are embedded right um, in the kind of the, the, the recesses of various plant heads like teasel and thistles. And they can use their tweezer-like beak to probe in to get it out. And uh, so many people will put um, a special kind of seed out in the garden called niger seed. It's a very small seed. Uh, you need a very uh, a feeder with very tiny holes to stop it pouring out. Um, but they will equally take seed from um, the, the general mixes as well. And the, the third main species that you're likely to get is the green finch. Um, this time, this bright green bar. The female um, is a bit of a duller version. Oops, sorry, I'll just go back. Um, uh, yeah, it's not quite as bright orange, but it's basically the same pattern. Um, again, a, a really big vice-like beak here. And again, thinking of the, the pecking order that you get around uh, feeders, uh, the green finch is number one. And they'll often come in in flocks and they're, they're kind of bully boys, really. They'll just hang around the feeder and they'll chase up everything else, even when they're not feeding, just kind of saying, well, this is mine and you're not having any. So let's move on to another group that visits gardens I've, I've called little brown jobs. Um, they're not closely related at all, but they don't have the color of the birds that we've looked at so far. So in my garden, possibly the dunnock is the commonest. Um, it's an, an interesting bird in, in that it's occasionally been referred to as the hedge sparrow, but that's a complete misnomer. It's not a sparrow at all. You can see that if you look at the beak, you know what we just said about finches and a, a sparrow is a kind of finch um, having big thick beaks. This is quite small and slender. Um, so it's actually in a group called Accentors. Um, the only other uh, example I can think of in Europe is the Alpine Accenta. Um, but this one clearly um, doesn't worry about going up mountains. It's quite happy in gardens. But you'll often find it on the ground, whereas nearly all the birds that we've seen, uh, possibly with the exception of the chaffinch, the chaffinch also is quite happy feeding on the ground. This one, 95% uh, of its time is spent feeding on the ground. They look like little mice jumping in and out of, um, of, of low vegetation. And they'll often hang around the feeders hoping to pick up scraps that have been dropped from the other birds rather than go up to the feeder themselves. But uh, although they, they can look a bit plain, you know, if you look closely, they're quite attractive. You know, this chestnut back and, and the kind of lovely kind of silver gray kind of um, head and throat, which kind of merges into brown on, on the chest. Compare that with the house sparrow. The male is a lot easier to identify than the female. Um, it has this gray cap and a black bib under its, under its, its beak. The female is plainer, um, but again, the beak helps to distinguish it from, uh, from the dunnock. Again, looking at them close up here, you can see the differences. Um, generally, you won't find the house sparrow on the ground as much as you'd find the dunnock. Um, they're not, of course, um, very common anymore, house sparrows. You might be lucky and have them in your area, um, but in many parts uh, of urban areas, particularly now, they've kind of disappeared. And there's been a lot of research to try and work out why. Um, and they're not 100% sure. It's probably a combination of factors. Um, not enough food uh, for the juveniles. Then, like a lot of birds, they need to feed their, their, their young on caterpillars and insects. But crucially, during the winter, they feed on seeds and um, they, they, they can't find necessarily enough natural food, although they do visit feeders. But possibly the most um, important factor is that they don't distribute very well. Some birds like blue tits will travel miles from their nest site where they were born to uh, find a new territory uh, a long, long way away from um, their parents' territory. House sparrows don't do that. They, they're kind of mummy's boys, really. They, they, they hang around. Um, in the same territory, often form little family groups, small flocks, and don't move away. And so what happens then is 
uh, for whatever reason, if that little mini colony gets wiped out for whatever reason, that color, that area, that territory doesn't get re repopulated by other house sparrows because they're just not traveling far enough. And finally, I've, I've put the wren into this uh, group. Um, it's quite a secretive bird. It's not uncommon in gardens. Um, and definitely, I think, uh, ticks the description of a, a little brown job. It's not quite the smallest bird in Britain, but it's uh, the third smallest. But it has a really short tail, and the tail tends to stick up. Uh, so it's kind of, if you see that sticky up tail, um, then, then it's, it's very clear. It has this very um, delicate eye stripe as well. It might be small, but it's got one of the loudest voices of all birds. So if you hear it sing, uh, if you hear some kind of incredibly loud noise <laughs> coming out of the bushes, it could well be the wren. So let's let's move on to a whole new habitat now. We're going to look at, at wetland birds. Um, and these two are often confused. Uh, they're both in the same family, they're, they're rails. Um, the coot has a white mask on the front of its head and basically the mine has a red mask. There are other differences but that's a very clear cut obvious one. Um, the, uh, you may wonder why, where the, the name as bald as a coot came from and if you look at the young, um, these are only a few days old, then you're going to get a clue there. Although it might be the, the fact that the, this shiny white front uh, also looks like it's a bit bald. Um, the moorhen on the right um, that occupies similar habitats in a way, but the, the moorhen will be found in smaller water bodies, you know, even quite small ponds uh, along the canal and so on, whereas the coot tends to prefer bigger water bodies, um, lakes, reservoirs, uh, etc. And you'll often see the, the moorhen um, swimming frantically away from you. Um, and they have this kind of rather jerky um, effort to swim, you know, where you know, each time the, 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 the feet go, go around to push the water, they jerk forward and then there's a pause and then another jerk. And just for comparison, the, the young of Moorhen, um, they're just like little tennis balls of black fluff. There's nothing much about them other than they just buzz around. They, don't, they barely look like birds if you see newly born ones. They just move really quickly, you know, scurrying for cover. They don't look anything like, like the coots. Both of them, have incredible feet. Now, you don't often see the feet because they're often in the water, but if ever you, you can get one that comes out possibly to, to feed um, and you get a look at their, their, their feet, their, their toes are incredibly long and they're designed to be able to walk on the surface of lilies and other uh, water aquatic vegetation without sinking in, so it spreads their weight. So sticking with wetland birds, um, possibly one of our most spectacular birds, the, the great crested grebe. This is um, a common bird that you'll find on pretty much every reservoir, um, any big lake really, you, you know, in, in, unless it's you know, the, the common at Watermead, for example, Thornton Reservoir, the, the, the over winter, that they spend all year there. And they're easy to identify in the summer because they both the males and the females are kind of identical and they both produce this amazing headdress of feathers. And if you're lucky enough um, in kind of early May or possibly even late April to see the courtship display, that's very ritualized. You know, they do this penguin dance where they can swim towards each other and they kind of push themselves out of the water uh, almost as a mirror image of each other. In winter, they're a little bit harder to identify because they lose those spectacular head feathers. Um, but they're quite large birds. They do sit low in the water. In fact, you can see that clearly on this top one. You know, it looks like it's sinking, doesn't it? Um, Their buoyancy is such that, um, that they're, they're, they're almost more underwater than on, on the surface. And they are diving birds, as you might gather from that big dagger-like beak. They, they'll swim really fast underwater and they'll chase down fish. So they eat mainly fish. And quite big fish as well. I've seen seen them catch, you know, fish that's maybe you know 25 centimeters long. It struggles to swallow it, but it, it'll get it down eventually. And if you're lucky, you might see some of the babies around about this time of year, and they look a bit like this, like little humbugs with um, these kind of black and white necks. They're often, when they're small, they're carried around on the backs of the adults, 
Um, so, uh, and then they just seem to disappear <laughs> in the plumage on the back of, of, of the adults. And then when they feel like it, they'll jump out and go for a swim and hopefully uh, a bit of breakfast as well. Now, the other green, which you are uh, quite likely to see, uh, it's, it's reasonably common in Leicestershire, is the little green. Now, this is tiny. Um, in summer, it has this lovely, uh, you know, ready chestnutty uh, neck and this kind of white patch just at the base of the beak here and, and a bit of, you know, ready ginger along the edge. But in winter, they look quite different. And the, they're, maybe because they're small and they need, that it's harder for them to keep warm, the, you nearly always see them with fluffed up feathers. Always looks like the, 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 they're wearing, you know, big woolly pants or something. It gives them this enormous fluffy bottom. Um, but they're quite uh, nervous and secretive. And uh, if they see you coming, they'll just dive. And they'll, you'll, you'll struggle to find where they come up because they can swim quite a long way underwater. And then they will often emerge within the bankside vegetation, hidden away. But if you're quiet and, and look around, you, there's, you, you see plenty of them. There are other grebes that you could see, but they're all quite rare. Uh, and the mainly grebes that you tend to see at migration time. So a quick look at the, the geese. These are the two common geese that we get uh, in, in Leicestershire. The Canada goose uh, and the grey lag goose, very, very different. Um, but you often see all manner of different colours of geese out mixing with them, white geese and uh, piebald geese. And these are all uh, domestic geese hybrids. I think they either escape or they're released from people that are keeping them in captivity. And then they, they, they mix in with the natural birds and they will often hybridize with the gray lag goose. So um, sometimes it's a little bit difficult to know what you're looking at, but um, you know, this, this lovely kind of browny gray uh, plumage, bright orange beak and kind of a ready pink legs um, is, is what you're looking for. The Canada goose is barely referred to now as a kind of a wild goose because it doesn't, there are wild Canada geese that do come to Britain, but they, they tend to be migrants. Whereas most of the Canada geese that we'll see in Leicestershire are resident here. And they, they manage to get through the winter quite happily by feeding on bread and other handouts. So let's have a quick look at some of the ducks. There are quite a number of ducks. I'm not gonna go through them all, but just a, a quick introduction um, to, to some of these. Now the mallard is probably uh, the most common. Um, the males, well, with all the ducks, the males and females are quite different. So if you're learning ducks, forget the females, <laughs> just concentrate on the males. And they're all in the uh, finery this time of year because it's part of the breeding season. But later in the year, once it gets to July and August, they go into a, into a molting period where they need to uh, replenish all of their feathers uh, ready for the winter. And they, they often hide away at that point. Um, but when you do see them, they don't look anything like this. Um, in fact, they all look like females. Um, so you know, trying to identify ducks in, in August is a challenge. But uh, the, the mallard um, is quite easy to, to identify. You look for this bottle green head, and both the male and the female have this um, bright blue patch here. It's on the, on the, on the secondary feathers on their wing. Um, and that's quite a, a key feature for, for many birds. Um, in fact, of all the ducks I'm gonna show you, they've all got it apart from this one, the tufted duck, um, which doesn't have that, that, that feature. Um, but the tufted duck is you know, a quite beautiful duck, particularly the male, um, these white, flanks stand out a mile you can see them often you know way way out in a reservoir and often they've been quite big flat uh, flocks um and in the breeding season they have this plume uh hence the name tufted the female doesn't really have the the plume although maybe a little pathetic hint of one there but they also have this lovely golden eye so those features together um should should help you to, to confirm it's tufted duck and the gadwell is probably the plainest of the ducks, but it's quite common and often gets overlooked because it, it's not really colourful. Although if you see it close up, it, it's subtly quite pretty, uh, you know, with this kind of grey brown barring. But it has this white uh, patch here on the wings in the same way the, the mallard has the blue one. The gadwell has a white patch 
and often as they're moving around that's very conspicuous they've also got bright orange legs if you if you can see them and then the the, the, the final species i'm just going to look at is the smallest duck we have in britain the teal uh, this also has that colorful patch this time it's green so we've got blue white and green and uh, again quite a handsome duck um, it tends to hang around the shallows um, the tufted duck uh, and the gadwall uh, tend to be found out in the, found further out in open water. Um, the, the teal is a called a dabbling duck. It doesn't dive down. It just sticks its head down and tries to filter food out of the shallows. So you often find it right at the edges. So uh, I thought I'd just look at um, these two birds. You know, obviously when you're out and about, um, it's worth looking up. And, and these two really catch people's eyes. Obviously, they're two of our largest birds, uh, both raptors. And it, it's interesting that on nature spot, they're often the birds that appear to be most common. They are more commonly recorded than any other bird. I think it's because they are quite spectacular and they're easy to see when they're flying. And people think um, that it's, it's notable and they, they should let somebody know. It's, it's great to get the records, don't get me wrong. Uh, and what is interesting is that a lot of the records follow the routes of the main road network uh, in Leicester Road. In fact, you can virtually see where all the main roads are just by looking at the pattern of observations of both these birds. And that's because both of them uh, will feed on carrion and they, they, they're not uh, too proud to drop down and grab a mouthful of dead pheasant or whatever might have been hit by a car. Most commonly, you will see the buzzard soaring. Um, so you look for these kind of white patches uh, near the tips of its wings and, and, and the feathers as well, although they both have feathers, but crucially, it's got a rounded and, and, and barred tail. The red kite, on the other hand, has a, a long forked tail and has much bigger uh, white panels on its wings. So let's have a quick look at, uh, at the corvids. These do cause quite a bit of confusion for people because they're all basically black. Um, you know, how can you tell the difference between them? They are some of our commonest birds, so you'll definitely see most of these um, almost every time you go out. So, you know, a, a crow, all black with a, you know, quite a decent sized black beak. Um, normally found singly or sometimes in, in pairs compared to the rook, which is much more sociable. Uh, they nest colonially up in trees and hang around together. And um, although they're a similar size and they sound similar, um, the rook can be distinguished because it lacks feathers at the base of the beak. So this um, whitish patch you can see here is actually skin. It's their white skin. Um, it almost makes the whole beak look kind of gray white. So look out for that feature. Um, they'll often feed together. Uh, also with this one, the jackdaw, um, which is a lot smaller or a good bit smaller than the other two. And is easy to identify the, by this kind of gray nape. It's a very noisy bird, the jackdaw, and it kind of uh, speaks its name or at least says jack in a kind of sharp, uh, high pitched way. And you'll often see them, you know, practicing their aerobatics. Uh, they love flying around when it's windy. It's, it looks good fun if you've got the skills to uh, battle the wind. And another bird that's becoming increasingly common in the COVID family in Leicestershire now is the raven. It used to be very rare, um, mainly due to hunting. And it was thought at one time it was a mountain bird because that's the only place you saw it. And that's where it basically wasn't persecuted. Um, but it's not particularly a mountain bird. Um, it, it's a, it, it lives in similar places to the others. It does like to nest on cliff faces. So it nests in Leicestershire on quite a few of the quarries. Uh, wherever it can it can find a kind of a, a ledge that suits its purposes. So it's it's huge. It's the size of a of a buzzard, um, twice the size nearly of, of the crow and the rook. But that's hard to tell when they're flying. So there is quite a good way to see. I mean, look at this silhouette here. I can tell immediately that that's a raven. You could say, well, maybe it's the size of the beak, but it's not. It's the tail. The tail is wedge shaped, so it, it, whereas on, the, on all of the other corvids, it's flat. 
it would it would cut across here. Um, so this long diamond shaped tail is often quite obvious when they're flying. The other thing which will draw your attention to it is they have, as you might expect from being the biggest of the corvids, it has the deepest voice. And when it's calling, it's a really deep croak. And it sounds a bit like there's a pig flying over, that kind of you know grunting sound. So often it's the sound that attracts my attention. Then you look up and then there's a bit of search and you can often see them flying over. And uh, this is another member of the COVID family, which is quite common and I think becoming more common. It's kind of, it seems to be one of those species that's moving into urban areas, losing its fear of humans. Often in woodlands, it's very secretive and it's hard to get near to them. But uh, in recent times, I've started to see them in some of the city parks and so on. And is definitely the, the prettiest of all the corvids. Uh, this, this bright um, speckly blue patch on the wings, the, the, the pinky coloration, this black moustache. Um, it has a quite a grating sound. So you'll often hear it rather than see it, particularly if you're in a woodland, it's very much a woodland bird. And indeed it's the jay that is responsible for uh, the continued survival really of oak trees. Um, in a typical autumn, a jay will collect up to 10,000 acorns and it will cache them away, it will hide them under the ground in little nooks and crannies, um, ready uh, to revisit them in the colder months when there's, when there's nothing else to eat. And amazingly, it is able to remember a, a large proportion of them, but it doesn't remember them all. And of course, some birds will die anyway. So those that get forgotten about will often sprout into, into new oak trees. There are a couple of other uh, corvids. Um, one I haven't included because it's so obvious, the magpie. I'm sure you know what a magpie looks like. There is one other species in Britain, which we don't get in Leicestershire, which is the chuff, uh, which is black with a red, thin pointed beak. Really spectacular bird, but you have to go to Cornwall or South Wales to see that. And um, I just wanted to also to, to suggest that you, as I did at the beginning, really, you listen out for birds. But these two um, are really, their sound is quite common. So actually I can just play these. Um, so the buzzard's call, it's called a mewing because it sounds a bit like a cat. I imagine, you I imagine you've probably heard that, uh, but you may not know what it is. But if you, if you hear it, um, just search the skies, you'll often see one and often several uh, buzzards. Uh, they, they soar around, they, they pick up the thermals and, and they soar so they don't have to flap. The other really interesting sound is the green woodpecker. And again, it's a bird that's quite hard to see. It's very secretive, but it's a very loud call. And it's, got, it's even got a name for the call. It's called a yaffle. So listen to this one. Dave, we can't hear either of those. Can you not? No. Ah. Yeah, I was just going to check actually whether other people had heard. Uh, well, OK, sorry then. I can hear them clearly enough. Well, what I suggest you do, don't worry now, but just remember these two species and go on to, say, the RSPB website and listen to them and try and memorise them. The green woodpecker is quite hard to see, but it's so common. Um, it, I hear it from my garden the whole time, uh, but I virtually never see it because it, it, unlike the other woodpeckers, it feeds on ants. So you often find it on... On, on lawns, it's 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 uh, it's a grassland feeder. Okay, so let's move on to butterflies. Now there's a lot less butterflies, so uh, less to to get confused with. So uh, these are the butterflies that overwinter as adults. You may have even had them in your house or your shed or your loft. Uh, they'll often look for a a little hide hidey hole where they can avoid the frost. Um, and, and the nice thing with butterflies is they're nearly all really colourful and, and quite striking. Um, so the small todd shell, I think, is one of our most beautiful butterflies. Um, when I was a, a kid and I was kind of getting into butterflies, uh, I always used to go searching for the large tortoise shell because it was in my book. Um, and I, I must have got excited at every tortoise shell I, I found thinking it might be it. But it was all a waste of time because it was largely extinct in, in Britain. They're trying to reintroduce it in various places. Another one, uh, you may be familiar with some of these, uh, the Red Admiral. 
um, with these kind of bold red slashes across its wings. Um, the peacock, how can you mistake that for anything with the peacock eyes on its wings? Um, the, the comma, often when you see the comma, you just see this flash of bright orange. Um, if it does rest and it opens its wings, then it has this very jagged end, uh, but often they'll then close the wings and you get an idea of how good their camouflage is for overwintering in vegetation. They'll often overwinter in, in ivy uh, or other dead vegetation. And you can imagine just when the wings are closed and they're tucked in uh, amongst the leaves, it's almost impossible to spot. It gets its name, the comma, because of this white mark here on the underwing. Um, and all of those species breed on nettles. So again, um, you might find them as caterpillars uh, as well as, as adults. And the fifth species that overwinters as an adult is the brimstone. Um, a lovely kind of herald of spring, really, when you see the, the, you know, the bright yellow males come through. The females are quite pale. They're still vaguely yellow, but it's, they almost could be mistaken for a white butterfly. But again, these have this lovely outline that, and it, it clearly mimics a leaf, doesn't it? Um, in, in the winter, their coloration is much drabber, so they were blending with, with dead leaves. So let's have a, a look at the whites. Um, although it's probably the butterfly that everybody thinks they know, or the cabbage white, but it's actually one of the hardest ones to identify the common butterflies, because um, there are several and they all look largely the same. <coughs> So the, the small white, um, let me bring up the other one for comparison. This is the large white. Now the large white, as you'd expect, is larger, but sometimes that's not always clear to see. Um, the, um, the males and the females have different numbers of spots on the wings, but again, that doesn't really help distinguish them. So what you have to do is you have to look at the extent of the black in the tip of the wing. So in the small white, it's often quite pale and it's, um, it forms like an extended triangle. It runs down the edge of the wing. Whereas in the large white, it's more of an equilateral triangle. It extends equally on the top of the wing as it does on the lower part of the wing. And it's often a denser black. So when you get your eye in for that, actually they're not that difficult to tell apart. Possibly the biggest confusion, though, is not between these two. It's the small white getting confused with the green vein white because they are pretty much the same size. And as you can see, the, the top of the butterfly looks vaguely the same. Um, you'll see as you, if you look closely as you run down the upper wing, it has these little black uh, inlets coming in into the wing. But that's often hard to see, particularly if it's flying. In fact, you can't really tell these two species apart when they're flying. Um, but as soon as it rests, you want to look at the underwing and the green vein white, as you know, as it says on the tin, has this dark uh, green yellow veining on the underside of, 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 of the wing, which is normally quite plain to see. It may not have this yellow tinge, but the darker veining is normally pretty obvious. All of these um, feed on crucifers. Um, the large white caterpillars, they, they, they hunt in packs. So that's the one particularly that gardeners don't like because uh, once the, the eggs are laid on, on your brassicas and the, and the caterpillars hatch out, you know, if you've got 50 caterpillars, um, they can soon munch through your, your vegetable patch. The, the small white um, will also feed on the same kind of food, but the caterpillars uh, disperse and they feed singularly. Interesting different strategy for trying to avoid um, being eaten. Um, sometimes there's, there's, there's um, strength in numbers, but also the large white caterpillars are more brightly colored. So I suspect they've got some kind of toxin in them. Whereas the small white caterpillars are, are green and obviously going to camouflage more. And that's why they would live solitary in, in, uh, life. So they're not drawing attention to each other. The other one which I'll just throw in here is the orange tip. Now you're probably familiar with the male. I haven't got a picture of the male, but it has bright orange tips to its wings. So you're not going to mix, mistake that with any of the others. But what about the female? You know, it's white with black dots and black tips to the wings. So if you're only looking at the top, 
then it's still quite easy to distinguish them, but you need a reasonable view. You see how rounded this wing is on the corner, whereas on all of the other butterflies, it's pointed in comparison. But as soon as it comes to rest and you can look at the underside of the wing, hey presto, it's, it's clear as day. But it's an orange tip because both the males and females have this uh, lovely kind of moss-like mottling on the underside. So we'll have a quick look at the browns. Um, these are not so much garden butterflies. You find them more out in you know, meadow areas, sometimes in woodlands, uh, in, in glades and that kind of thing. The meadow brown is probably the most common. Um, it's the archetypal brown butterfly you see flapping across uh, grassy meadows. Um, the males and the females are, are quite different. The males tend to be darker and have less orange on them. This particular photo isn't always that typical. There's quite a bit of variation. You could almost reverse these colors because often the male is so dark, it almost looks black. And it does have this little eye spot and a hint of orange, but not much. Whereas the female has very clear orange on the upper wings. But no, there is no orange on the lower wings on either of them. And this is the easiest way to distinguish it from another brown, which is also very common, it's out and about at the moment, uh, the gatekeeper, sometimes called the hedge brown. And uh, the easiest way to distinguish it is that it's got orange on all four wings. It also has two eye spots, whereas the meadow brown only has one. And a couple more uh, in the browns that, you, that are relatively common you might come across. Um, and I'm picking here the commonest butterflies. These are the ones you're most likely to, to encounter. Uh, this is the ringlet. You often find it on um, in grassy rides in woodlands, uh, sometimes uh, on the banks of streams and so on. It likes a bit of shade. Um, it's a bit more secretive than some of the others. Um, will kind of sink down into the, into the vegetation. Uh, the, the, the male is, is quite dark, but it has eye spots on both, on all four wings. But also, and this is the thing that I tend to notice more than anything, it has this lovely white border, which immediately distinguishes it. This clear cut white border, as if somebody's drawn around it in a, in a crayon, uh, which you don't get on the meadow brown. And of course, if you see them with the wings closed, um, those, those eye spots are much more pronounced. And again, that lovely white border. Uh, and the other one um, I'll just point to is the speckled wood. This is a butterfly that's quite common now, it's, as the name suggests. It's a, a, a butterfly that you'll find in a lot of hedgerows and in woodlands. Uh, it used to be not found this far north until about 20 years ago. And it was one of the first indicators of climate change, which started extending its range, moving northwards. So now you find it all the way up into Scotland. Um, but it, this kind of the, the white spots, this, it's almost, you can see almost why it would blend in in a, in a wooden environment where you've got dappled light, because it just looks like you've got dappled light striking it through the trees, doesn't it? And just one more I'll throw in, another of the browns that is a bit of a specialist. It's, uh, it's a heathland, moorland specialist. Um, if you go to Bragate Park, it's quite common. Um, but interestingly, amongst pretty much all of these butterflies, apart from when it's flying, it never opens its wings. It's clearly, you know, quite a shy little butterfly. Doesn't want to show us what it's got on the inside. Uh, so you only ever see uh, when it's at rest um, the the underside of the wings. But even so, it's fairly easy to identify. Partly the small size, but partly the fact that it doesn't open its wings. But also this pale bar that runs down. That, that's quite obvious when you see it out in the field. But as I say, you'd have to go to kind of more kind of acid environments uh, to to see that one. So a quick look at the blues now. The holly blue is probably the commonest blue and the one you are most likely to see in your garden, probably the only blue you're likely to see in your garden. Um, and it has become much more common in, in recent times. It's this kind of, it has a beautiful, the male has a beautiful blue. Um, the female has these black bars on the outside of its wings, but both of them have this very striking silvery blue underside. And as we'll see in a minute, compared to the common blue, it's very, very different. There's no other blue that has a, an underside wing like that one. And this is interesting because it has two generations a year. Uh, the first generation, they breed on holly. 
Um, and then the caterpillars that feed on holly pupate, and then they hatch out July, August time to form the second generation. And they then breed on ivy and their caterpillars um, feed up and then they will overwinter and, and, and not hatch out as adults until spring the following year. So the other blue that you may see out and about um, is the common blue. Um, superficially, it looks the same, particularly the males. You know, this lovely bright blue, um, although it's not always blue, it, it, it can have partly blue, partly brown. Um, both the males and the females um, can have a little bit of a mixture, but on the whole, the males have a lot more blue than the females. Sometimes you can get a hint here of, of the blue scales on, even on the female, and sometimes it'd be more pronounced than that, but normally a mixture of, 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 of blue and, and brown. Uh, but the female has these orange, uh, spots running along the edge of the wing. And if you look at the underside of the wing, very different to the holly blue. Can't really mistake them if you get a good picture. Now sticking with the blues, uh, you wouldn't think this was a blue, but the fact that there are orange pigments in, uh, in the common blue tells you that that is something that um, can be generated within the family. So in this case, this small copper has dispensed with blue altogether and, and gone down the orange route. It's a beautiful little butterfly, it's tiny. In fact, all the blues are tiny. Um, but this one's around at the moment, often uh, fluttering around on, in, in kind of open land. Uh, it will kind of sunbathe on the ground, often not always on flowers. Um, the common blue, just nipping back to that, it breeds on bird's foot trefoil. So you, if you find an area with bird's foot trefoil, then look out for the common blue. And I'll just throw this one in as well. This is a, a much less common butterfly, but not, not rare as such, uh, just not as common as the other. It's the brown argus. And you think, well, okay, that looks very similar to the female common blue. It does superficially, um, but the, it has a much cleaner look to it. The, the, the female common blue, the brown can be a bit dingy and it has this bit of blue coming through and the, the orange spots are quite variable. Often it has very few orange spots, sometimes like this when it has more, but they're never complete, form a complete row across both wings. Um, you can see in comparison, the brown argus, very clear, precise row of orange, orange dots. So it's a good one to look out for. Um, it, it's, it's just one of those you might just stumble across on, on, uh, on grassy areas. So let's move on to the skippers. Uh, these are strange little butterflies, if you've not uh, come across them. They look more like moths, quite small. Uh, this is the commonest of them, the large skipper. And this is uh, as far as you get with the wings extended. It'll sometimes close its wings like a tent over its, uh, fold them back over its body, but most of the time, <coughs> excuse me, um, it will rest like this. Um, but you notice not only is it bright orange, uh, but it has these darker marks on the wing. Now the small skipper in comparison um, is slightly smaller, um, but has plain orange wings or relatively plain, doesn't have those dark marks. This is one of the butterflies actually that's come um, less common over recent times. So we're not quite sure why, but uh, the regular, you know, Butterfly censuses found that this is declining. And so you think, oh, well, that's easy. You know, large skipper with the black marks on its wings, and that is easy. The small skipper doesn't have them, so it must be a small skipper. But there is another species um, that isn't as common, but is probably more common than you realize because the differences are quite subtle. And uh, it, it's the same size, it has the same plain orange wings, obviously with a black border, but there's no dark mottling on the wings. The difference here is a fine detail. You have to look at the tip of the antennae. It's often said that the Essex skipper looks like it's dipped its antennae in ink, because the whole end of the antennae um, is black all the way around. Whereas on the small skipper, um, the black runs down one edge, but not on the top edge. So let's have a slightly closer look at that. Um, so yeah, just, just think um, of, of the antenna being dipped in ink, and then you, you get the idea. This one's obviously you know, not so clear cut. 
in terms of where the black X stops and finishes. It has orange on the top as well. Uh, so it's only the black is only on the underside of um, of the antennae, whereas with the, the Essex skipper, it's all the way around. So these three you are quite likely to see, certainly the first two. And you know, how, depending how eagle-eyed you are, you might find the Essex skipper. There are two other skippers that we get in Leicestershire, which are quite rare. So I just wanted to show these just out of interest. Um, the the dingy skipper and the grizzle skipper. I never I think that they're very complementary names, certainly not the dingy skipper. Um, it's not very imaginative. And actually it's quite it's quite pretty. I don't know why it's called the dingy skipper, maybe because it's not fluorescent orange like some of the others. Um, both of them are very small, very flighty, um, spring flying uh, skippers, um, but they're only found on a few sites. You'd really have to go to a few specialist sites, nearly nature reserves to find them. So um, just to kind of sum up, um, if you're going to record birds and butterflies, um, what's the best way of going about it? Um, with all recording, if you can take a photo, when you submit your record, how do we know that you've identified it correctly? And if you attach a photo, that makes it easy. And certainly with butterflies, um, it, it, it certainly makes our lives easier if you have a photograph. I appreciate it's not always easy to take pictures and it doesn't have to be a great picture, as long as you can just about work out what it is. Um, it's not so important with birds, um, just historically, because birds, bird recording is so widespread. And clearly it's obviously possible to take pictures of a lot of birds, they're just too far away, too flighty. Um, so unless it's a rare bird, um, where you might get challenged for a bit more information, most bird records are, are, are largely going to be accepted. As I say, certainly the more common ones. But if you look on nature spots, um, every species in the galleries has a little colour code, a red, amber, green icon, which tells you how easy or difficult it is to identify. And so if you're learning, go for the green ones. Uh, what we're saying by that is that you're not likely to confuse it with anything else. Um, there are very few um, red birds. <laughs> they're nearly all fairly easy to identify because relatively they're quite large. There's a few that are amber, you know, have the orange icon because you could potentially mix them up with another. Um, so you just need to take a little bit of care and learn the differences between those two. So as well as those ID guides that I mentioned um, at the beginning, do use the next spot galleries in terms of the best overall guide to the wildlife that you'll see in Leicestershire and Rutland. Um, they're much more useful than um, general books because they only cover species that we find locally. You know, you're not going to have to plow through all the coastal species, and et cetera. So it, just a, another little uh, tip. If you're adding a record, uh, particularly say a butterfly, and for whatever reason you couldn't get a photo, add a little comment just to let us know how you identified it. So if it was a green vein white, you know, mention that you saw the, the veining on the, on the underside. So, any questions? For those of you that are coming on uh, Saturday, obviously we can have a chat then, um, and you can bring your questions along as many as you like at that point. But um, if anybody wants to ask anything now, you have to unmute and fire away. Or you've all fallen asleep. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it and found it useful. Um, we will send the link out uh, to the recording and it will also go on Nature Spot. So if you ever you wanted to flip back to it or to share it, you're very welcome. Um, and otherwise, I'll hopefully see you on Saturday, 10 o'clock at the Washbrook Nature Reserve. Thank, Thank you. Dave. Thank you, Dave.